Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second day of Vital Week. You're all very, very welcome. Um, today, um, just to let you know, as with yesterday, we have our uh, the session will be recorded and made available on the National Forum website uh, later on today. Um, I again, if you would like to have captions, if you just press the closed captions at the at the end of your screen, you'll be able to see the um, subtitles. Um, I'm also delighted to say that Esther Blado is with us again today for graphic illustrations, and we'll be sharing those at the end of this week at the closing session on Friday. Um, what I'd like to do now is to hand over to the chair uh, for today, uh, Dr. Leo Casey um, from the National College of Ireland and also one of the National Forum Board members. Leo, it's all yours. Thank you, Terry. Um, welcome everybody again, and um, I'm really looking forward to this session. I think there's a lot of uh, very interesting uh, inputs that we can look forward to in the next hour or so. In a moment, uh, we're going to have uh, the latest uh, research update from National Forum Teaching and Learning Research Fellow, Dr. Brett Becker from UCD. I think that's going to be really interesting, his presentation on teaching and learning for the next era of digital innovation. And following that, we have our GASTA master, Dr. Tom Farley, who will uh, manage and master all of the subsequent presentations. Uh, we have five really interesting topics from uh, a devolved model of um, management of OER to transformational learning, through to learning to cultivate empathy in undergraduate teaching, um, a presentation on immersive reality simulations, and also on data analytics processes. So a lot to look forward to. But to get us off to a very good start, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Brett Becker from UCD and his presentation on teaching and learning for the next era of digital innovation. Over to you, Brett. Thank you for the introduction, Leo. I'm thrilled to be here. And since you gave me such a great introduction, I think I can skip over this slide now. So we have more time for questions in the end. Um, the background and rationale for my work on digital innovation in teaching and learning is primarily motivated by the fact that the pace of digital innovation is accelerating and is by all measures likely to continue to do so um, without any stop. So I set out to look at how digital innovation is going to impact teaching and learning within the disciplines. So for example, lessons that can be transferred from one discipline to another in terms of digital innovation in different disciplinary contexts. Um, and just to give you a heads up for the next 10 minutes or so, we're not really talking about digital innovations that are used by all disciplines similarly. Um, so things like ed tech and video conferencing, things that we're all using fairly similarly. What I wanted to look at was the, the richness and diversity in, in the disciplinary contexts and how digital innovation is being used and is having impact there. And the aim is to help us all plan for the next digital era. Um, from a graduate point of view, how can we prepare our graduates to be digitally fluent in their disciplinary contexts? And to me, the most exciting thing is how can we use digital innovation within our own disciplines to create new knowledge in our disciplines? And, and that's where digital innovation really can, can advance a discipline. Um, so interesting stuff. My methods uh, included interviewing dozens of educators from all around Ireland, uh, archaeology to zoology, as I like to say. I had to make sure that I got them in there so that I could say that. Um, but I did cover all of the top level um, fields and many different subdisciplines. And the interviews looked at topics such as terminology, demands for digital innovation in their teaching and learning, uh, what they're doing in their current practice, and then probably the most exciting part was future planning 
including the challenges and opportunities that uh, digital innovation brings to us all in our classrooms. I also visited several educators to see their innovations in action, which I'll discuss in one minute here. Uh, and then coming from myself and the forum in, in, in the next year uh, is an open professional development course focused on identifying those dis discipline specific digital innovations uh, in terms of opportunities and challenge, transferring best practice from one discipline to another, and applying digital innovation in teaching and learning practice within your disciplinary context, whatever that is. As an example of current practice right now down in University of Limerick, equine science and equitation, they're exploring seriously about a dozen new possibilities in terms of what digital innovation can bring to their discipline. They're looking at using kinematic sensors and software. The top photo there, you see there's rain tension meters on uh, the horse there. So they, they look and feel pretty much like normal tack, uh, except those sensors are wireless and they feed data to uh, a phone or a computer. And that can allow a horse uh, and rider, for instance, to work better together. Uh, the, the rider can see what pressure has been applied and what the horse did in response. So there's an exciting opportunity there where we're looking at uh, an animal and a human working better together because of digital technology. There are parallels here to other um, uh, disciplines, which is one of the things that I looked at everywhere I went. So for instance, here, we could see parallels in physiotherapy and choreography to name only two. Uh, there are of course some challenges, terminology, which I already mentioned was a focus of my interviews. Uh, poor interfaces, general usability is an issue here, but these things will be solved. I mean, that's a, a hallmark of digital innovation almost is that it's a little difficult to use at first. But there's plenty of opportunities. Uh, for instance, th they have tons of project options um, that, that, that they have now available to them because of all of this data. There's new angles to safety and performance and they report that the student interest and engagement is fantastic. Another example of current practice um, that I found to be really exciting is digital technology bringing authentic learning experiences into the classroom. So here we're at the National Maritime College of Ireland in Ring of Skitty, and they have uh, dozens of simulators there uh, that, that bring authentic learning experiences to students without leaving the building, so to speak. So they can simulate engine rooms, radio communications, so many different things. Um, the challenges here certainly would be cost. Uh, the, these are not cheap, but they can be so authentic and so uh, immersive. And I'll have an example in 10 seconds. Um, but I have to say first that the reports are that these have been outstanding successes in the classroom that drive huge engagement, that they accelerate teaching and learning dramatically and can really, really facilitate mastery learning. So we're talking about students learning to do dangerous, very expensive, very time consuming tasks like navigating a ship across an ocean in the classroom. Uh, and, and the monetary cost of doing that in the real world is not even worth calculating. So I have a short video here that I hope plays. Uh, and this is their 360 degree ship bridge simulator. And this is me holding the camera. So those windows are real glass, they're real windows. I, can, I could go touch them and knock on them. And beyond those real windows is a screen that's several, several meters away. So this is inside a huge room uh, in terms of you know, lecture space, 200 students in this room. But it's essentially one room that is this bridge here that I'm in uh, inside another room, and that outer room holds the screen. So I'll just let you watch the last half of this video here. I do have to say that it actually felt like it was moving. All 
Okay, oops, I stopped sharing my screen. So I will go back to sharing my screen. Sorry about that. There we go. Okay, and the final example of current practice uh, is making new knowledge. So this is super exciting stuff. Uh, I'm really gonna dive into archeology span here for less than a minute. Uh, as a real context rich example. So there's a tension in archaeology in destructive testing, right? Archaeologists look at things that are rare by definition, uh, but sometimes you have to look inside things to learn more about them. So destructive testing, do you do it? Do you not do it? When do you do it? And this is where digital innovation is, is stepping in at this real tension in the field uh, to allow things like 3D scanning, um, software that can produce analogous proxies through pre 3D printing, uh, generating authentic physical copies that allow us to explore, uh, in this case, physical objects in new ways. But you can bring that uh, one step further in terms of making new knowledge. So there are examples where delicate ancient objects don't exist anymore because they all went away. But the molds that were used to create these objects were much more durable, and we have these. So using 3D scanning and 3D printing technologies, uh, we can recreate these molds and in the classroom, literally in the classroom for a couple hundred euro. Oops, that advanced, sorry. Um, you can create molds that are copies of molds we have, but use those molds to make the objects that the molds once made. And these objects don't exist, uh, but students are making analogous copies of them in the classroom. And the reports from the classroom there are, are that we can teach more, better, and quicker with physical engagement. This is not just faster, better, cheaper. This allows us to get straight to the teaching and for students to really be creative. And to me, creativity in archeology, span I, I have trouble reconciling that, but it's also extremely exciting. So this is the stuff uh, that digital innovation can bring when you when you allow it to to grow inside a, a, a rich disciplinary context. Uh, so initial findings, um, terminology is a challenge. Uh, I, I actually have a paper published at a conference a couple months ago on this. Um, almost everybody finds terminology to be a challenge. It turns out that different disciplines use things, even words like the word digital, very differently. Um, many disciplines face challenges that are similar to those faced by others. So there's also an opportunity here for us to learn from each other. The drivers of innovation vary from discipline to discipline, going from regulatory and industry down to students themselves. Um, another thing is that there's, a, there's this digital innovation gap between different disciplines. If you pick any two discipline pairs, um, you're, you're likely to see a gap. There are some that have been truly revolutionized by digital innovation. Uh, for instance, geography has been really revolutionized by geographic information systems, but other disciplines uh, have been impacted less so to date. But artificial intelligence does pose incredible opportunities. That really is gonna be my, my final point. Um, but there are many more challenges here, and these are worth noting. Uh, they're, in fact, more than noting. They're, they're worth not forgetting because they're going to come to every discipline. Over-reliance on technology, bias, security issues, ethical, moral, legal, economic implications, all of these things are very real, uh, and, and they exist now. And when these technologies come into the classroom, those, those challenges come, come with them. So what does this mean for uh, education now? I would say tackle digital terminology head on. If you're gonna be using technology in the classroom, uh, talk about how you're gonna talk. Awareness is very important. Who's doing what? If you face a challenge, it's likely that other people have, have, uh, have faced it before. So don't reinvent the wheel. Um, and ask yourself, how can digital innovation enable new knowledge creation in your context? Um, so like I said, I'm gonna have an open professional development course coming out early next year. 
That's going to tackle terminology, explore how digital innovation can impact your discipline and your teaching and learning, transfer opportunities and lessons learned from other disciplines <clears throat> into yours, share best practice and explore new knowledge creation within your disciplinary context. And as a parting thought here, don't dismiss artificial intelligence. AI will affect every discipline in two ways. One, I say, I call it from the outside across all disciplines. So for instance, AI is likely to allow personalized mastery learning to scale efficiently this decade. This will change all of our teaching and learning. It will also affect your discipline from the inside. It'll affect each discipline uniquely and fundamentally. So for instance, uh, digital innovation in arts and culture is at a pivotal moment. Um, AI can now compose music and write poetry, but there's a shift happening here. Um, this isn't the robots are taking over anymore. This isn't, you know, students are gonna write poetry with software and not be creative. There's a real shift here. AI is turning into tools that humans can use to do more, faster, better, and even more creatively. And I think that that's almost like that new knowledge creation thing. Uh, digital technology allows for creativity that we didn't have before. Um, so keep your eye on that space and I'm looking forward to questions. Thank you, Brett. Um, that was a really interesting um, overview of the state of art of uh, digital innovation and in teaching and learning in uh, across the sector. Brett, just one thing that occurred to me, and I, I wrote it down when you said it, and you mentioned that there's innovation that like maybe changes aspects of the way we do things, but there's innovations that allow us to create new knowledge. And you gave some examples of, of that. Would, would you maybe just elaborate a little bit on what you think the implications of that new ways of, no, of knowing uh, are? Yeah, well, I think that this really is going to fundamentally change the way we, we teach and the way that students learn. Uh, the archaeology example, for instance, I mean, it's, it's very easy to, to see uh, a, a student being given these tools and doing something that that the instructor did not see coming at all and has never seen, you know, um, literally do, doing new combinations of things, new ways of expressing creativity or, or using these tools um, where the, the teacher really will learn from the student, for instance. So that's just one example. Um, but I really think that, that that new knowledge and that creativity, those fronts are where what digital innovation allows is, is going to advance our own disciplines. It... Um, and on that point, and just to remind everybody that if you have questions for Brett, now we have only a few minutes, but if you can um, um, post them in the chat, we'll, we'll see if we can be able to pass them on. Um, but I do think as also in your presentation, you mentioned it, and I see it coming in on the chat, this, um, idea around the impact of digital technology, as you said, outside of each discipline, meaning across the institution, but also within the disciplines. Again, would you just maybe comment a wee bit about that, how maybe different disciplines are um, progressing to, to a greater and lesser extent with the application of new technology? Yeah, so I there are going to be some equalizing technologies. Um, for instance, we, we all have heard of mastery learning. A lot of us have, have used it. Um, a lot of us would like to use it, but there are these challenges and costs involved. Right now, it's largely a human cost. It's, it takes time. Um, and, and if you're going to uh, you know, really utilize mastery learning in the classroom with 100 students, you need to keep track of where all these hundred students are and, and tools are gonna to allow us to do that. And that will largely affect all disciplines kind of equally. It, it, it will allow us to, to use very fundamental pedagogical principles and apply it to our own disciplinary context kind of regardless of what that context is, right? Um, then there's these other more fundamental shifts like geography and architecture. I mean, architecture revolutionized by digital technology. 
architects have to produce plans now that, that are, are 3D um, moving in many cases. Uh, and this is all driven by regulatory government you know, mandates. Energy efficiency is all modeled before a plan is approved. Uh, literally fundamentally change the discipline. So that's something specific to architecture, but there are lessons there that could absolutely be used by other disciplines who haven't yet felt that real revolutionary impact yet. And we do have to be mindful of that gap. There are absolutely, in, in different ways, there are different uh, disciplines that are that are doing more and, and impacted more and, and some that are doing less. And that, that's not the fault of anybody. You know, it may just be a fundamental thing uh, about what you do. Uh, you know, for instance, creativity, it's really just creeping in there in terms of the creative arts, but it's coming. Thank you. And just to mention that there's a lot of uh, very positive comments coming in on the chat and people are finding your your um, both your commentary and your presentation extremely interesting and engaging. Now we're going to have to move on because we have the big gasta coming up in a moment. But um, just a, a final comment, because a lot of people are welcoming this this um, um, open course that you've mentioned. Um, have you any update on when that might happen and where people will go, obviously, to the forum to find out when, when it might be announced? Yeah, so it, it'll be added to the to the forum's schedule of PD courses uh, in, in 2022. I'm, I'm hoping early in 2022. Uh, first, I have to have it done. And, and then second, uh, I'm sure there's some logistics in terms of, you know, with the academic flow of the year when things are, are released. But I, I do, you know, if there's demand, I, I, I know our aim is to meet it. So uh, this isn't going to be a one offering and, and walk away. Everybody who wants to do it, I think the aim is to have them do it. The first offering, you know, there's like every time there's going to be some teething problems and probably a, some limited capacity, um, but it'll, it'll come. So just keep your eyes there. Wonderful. And Terry says it's in the spring 2022 open courses. So uh, again, um, thanks again, um, Brett. And uh, just checking is Tom uh, um, on online at the moment. So I'm going to hand over oh, yes. to oh, the yes, Leo. part, Tom. I've been you? hovering in the background, Leo. I, I, hovering in the background. <laughs> you, were, you were very disappointed yesterday. You didn't get to exercise the big stick enough. I didn't know. And I mean, hopefully now a couple of, you know, a couple of good people here now, hopefully they, they, they've slipped today. So uh, well done. Uh, Brett, Brett, really, really, really interesting piece there. And uh, thanks, thanks for that, Leo. I'll be handing back to you at the end of this. I'm delighted I'm in a new room today, which shows off my Movember a little bit better. It looked like a, I looked like a 12 year old boy yesterday trying to grow a mustache. Anyway, I won't delay, um, as I said, we're, we're already, oh my God, we're three minutes behind time. Anyway, our first person is a good friend and collaborator, Angelica Risquez from the University of Limerick. And she's gonna be presenting um, towards a devolved model of management of OER, the case of the Irish higher education sector. I think anything to do with OER is an open access. Somebody knows me as a is dear to my heart. So uh, you know, oh, she's looking really well sorted out here now. That's almost we're ready to go. Okay, everybody. Um, best of luck to you, Angelica. And uh, uh, being a good a good friend, you know, if you want to go over the five minutes, by all means, feel feel <laughs> that way like that. Uh, because I think people are looking for a bit of blood today. I know that. I just kept myself my, my stopwatch is ready to okay so we all ready we'll start off nice and easy today we won't be doing any swaying just yet but uh, we get the bull flowing in a little while are we all ready get the hands yep. up get yep. the hands up get the speakers on knock on your speaker knock on your mics are we all ready yep uh, hey 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 no no a tree Awesome. 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 Thank you, Tom, and the uh, timer is on. So thank you for the opportunity to present on this. Good morning to everyone. My presentation is titled Towards a Devolved Model of Management of OER, the Case of the Irish Higher Education Sector. So my name is Angelica Risket from UL. Um, this paper was published last year on the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning. And uh, giving here uh, very much thanks to all my co-authors, uh, Claire McAvinia, Yvonne Desmond, Catherine Brun, Deidre Ryan, and Anne Coughlin. 
the focus on OER indeed came to the fore during the pandemic period because of its uh, impact on access, equity, and inclusion, but also its impact on the, on the achievement of learning outcomes. However, the most recent Horizon report places the question that since OER has such obvious benefits for higher education in terms of adaptability and cost savings, why are they not more widely created and used? What are the enablers and constraints for their uptake? So in answering this question, perhaps one of the possible directions is to look at management of OERs. We know that sustainable management of OER is crucial for their wide implementation. And we can, we've traditionally looked at different options from conventional, conventional national level repository systems, repositories that are created ad hoc for OER creation, courseware platforms, uh, VLEs adapted for open access, uh, for example, in Moodle, web 2 services, and many more, the likes of YouTube, SlideShare, and so on. Choosing a storage model in any case is dependent on a specific context, on motivation, intended outcomes, the institutional priorities, digital capacity of everyone involved, and so on. So from this perspective, uh, we uh, look at the Irish sector, and in Ireland, uh, the creation of uh, open research outputs has been dealt with through the REAM project and institutional repositories, which are basically a uh, curation of all open research to be uh, shown in a, in a professional way. So um, there was a subsequent research project um, a number of years ago, um, which was published. Uh, and it, it was a wider scope to study open education in Ireland in marginal terms. But one of the questions that we investigated as part of that was to uh, the potential of using existing institutional research repositories for the purpose of ingesting, managing, and discovering OER produced by academics. So in order to investigate that, we went with a multi-mixed methods approach through an online survey with academics, a number of focus groups in a number of higher education institutions, and also a focus group with the institutional repository managers. So what we learned is that there was a balance to be struck between opportunities and challenges. Yes, there was an opportunity being recognized of institutional repositories to ingest open educational resources and even to help to uh, achieve that parity of esteem and that link between research outputs and teaching resources. But many challenges were also identified, mostly that there was a clear institutional purpose to do so, that they were properly resourced, and there were also concerns around intellectual rights, about quality management of all those resources and the model for, for this to happen. So that's basically where we left it. And Ton, this may be the first time in Yogasta that a speaker has finished before the time. <laughs> but <laughs> if, uh, if you want to learn more, obviously, the paper is already published and up there for all you. So I just acknowledge my references here. And Gasta. <laughs> Angelica, you're, most, you're supposed to be a mate. Or you're supposed to look at the, the crowd we're baying from. Dude. It's not me. It's not me. I'm happy for you to finish early. But the likes of Ken McCarthy and all the rest of them, they came here looking for a bit of blood. Now, honestly, well done. A great piece. I, I actually put up the, the link to the paper in a row. It really is a great piece. It's a great paper and certainly well worth looking. And as I've said to everybody, uh, and, and I'll do it at every GAS session, please reach out to the people. They're doing great work here. So listen, if we're not getting ahead of time, I won't delay any anymore. We have uh, Trevor Clossy. Uh, so we're moving from Limerick. We're going to go up the coast, up to uh, GMIT. Hi, Tom. How are you keeping? Grand out. Okay. So if we're all ready now, as I said, we'll... we'll uh, we we'll start off uh, limbering up a little bit. I love your background, by the way, Angelica. So we, um, okay, so everybody get the hands up here. We're going to go to the left to start this one off here like that, because as I said, we're going to walk up at dinner here. Ready? Are we all ready? Uh, hey. Hey. Yeah. A dough. A A dough. 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 A Hi everyone, my name is uh, Trevor Classy and uh, today I'll be presenting my uh, research on uh, transformational learning 
in higher higher education and um, this research is by myself and Dr. Mary English from the Galway Mayo Institute of Technology. Um, I suppose, you know, over the last 10 years um, uh, as an educator, you know, you know, students come in learning and they gain the new process of uh, new understanding, knowledge, new behavior, skills, values and attitudes. And, um, you know, I, I would teach in the technology sphere and um, throughout the last decade, I've noticed the students they get stuck on specific topics and it's this, they get stuck and they, they can't get out of that position and it, it causes them trouble across their academic career and also when they go into the workplace. So I, I suppose I, I began to del delve a bit deeper and I came across this concept of threshold concepts. Now threshold concepts represent conceptual gateways and they're, they're a kind of an approach which builds on the notion that there are certain concepts or certain learning experiences um, which resemble passing through a portal for which a new perspective opens up for the student, allowing things formerly not perceived to come into view. Um, this enables students to think about a new topic in a manner that was previously inaccessible. So in, in other words, um, a transformation occurs within the student's frame of learning. And from my experience of teaching IS, you know, there's definitely threshold concepts within the curriculum that they get stuck on. Some students can move quickly and become on and stuck, but there are students who will get stuck into these concepts and they will cause them problems. Um, so, you know, the theories I've learned, so I, I, I adopted a case study approach where I interviewed students um, from fourth years who were in the, in, studying information systems. And I also interviewed lecturers and I used four theories of learning, threshold concepts, which I discussed and troublesome knowledge. So this is knowledge they get stuck on within the threshold concept itself. I also looked at social cultural development. So learning occurs at higher education with a knowledgeable other, usually a lecturer or a tutor, and that knowledgeable other is important. But learning also incur, occurs in communities of practice. So whether that community of practice is within their own groups, within the college, or within work placement and so on. So the framework I used was um, this framework by Landon Meyer, so I won't spend too long, but there's three phases. The preliminary phase is all about students encounter with that troublesome knowledge. They then, you know, they try to get over a liminal space and within that liminal space, they're given new knowledge, they try to assimilate it, they go undergo an ontological shift, and hopefully they can come out at the post-liminal stage where they're, they've developed new knowledge, it's irreversible, and then they can apply it in, in the workforce and so on. Um, and I suppose, you know, these are the results of um, the, the case study I did of four years. I identify specific threshold concepts um, and within those threshold concepts, so for example, they're delineated there at the preliminary phase, the start of their learning journey, um, they're delineated there in black font, database design, business process modeling, and social systems. And within each of these threshold concepts, there was troublesome knowledge which was, which was causing them, um, which had caused them large difficulties and challenges. And in terms of the liminal space crossing the conceptual boundary to get to the post-liminal phase, they found peer learning, peer support, practical application, independent learning, lecture support and experience, work-based mentor support and work-based uh, place-based learning so critical to overcoming the troublesome knowledge allowed them to get experience in the threshold concept. And the, just with a minute to go, the main conclusions that came out with the research was a student's ability to traverse through the liminal space varies. You'll have those students who will encounter those threshold concepts and they'll sail through that troublesome knowledge. There are some students who will, when they enter the liminal space, they'll go back to the preliminal phase, back to the liminal phase, and they'll never reach the post-liminal phase. Um, Practice and repetition of threshold concepts and troublesome knowledge is very important. The applied nature of these theoretical concepts. Exposure to environments where the threshold concepts and knowledge can be teased out and questioned is also important. So in simulations and in workplace environments. Exposure and refinement of skills within a community is important also. Um, the impact of COVID-19 had a huge impact on the learning. They've gone from traditional learning to online learning, and this resulted in new threshold concepts and troublesome knowledge. And I suppose the last note, 15 seconds, language is important. Having a glossary when your student in, enters in first year and say, look, you're gonna encounter these threshold concepts, year one, year two, year three, year four, here's how we're gonna get over them. And thanks a million for that, Gasta.
Oh, Trevor, Trevor, man, you're, you're, you're all breaking my heart here. You're they're all so well organised. I, I never used to see this level of organisation. I mean, this is one of the things I love about being Irish. We have this such blatant disregard for timekeeping. <laughs> and, and suddenly, I don't know, what, what have I actually done to people that have, I've, I've changed the, the limits? Well done. No, it's a really, really good piece of work. I'm just going to move on because I am very, very mindful of our time. So we've gone from Limerick to GMIT. We're going to sweep right across the country over to Trinity College Dublin to Svetlana and the uh, Can a virtual education learning cultivate empathy in undergraduate teaching? Very interesting uh, thing to position uh, and certainly in, I think it would have always been an interesting topic to look at. But uh, I think given the experience of the last uh, year and a half, I think it's certainly even the more all the more interesting. Uh, hopefully people are, if someone can give me a thumbs up, if it's the sound a little bit better than it was, I believe it was coming in and out. Is it, uh, is it any better? Excellent. Uh, that's good to hear. Okay, so Svetlana, are you ready to go once I give you the count in? Yep. Okay, doke. Right. Uh, are we all ready? I won't even ask you to sway. We'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the swaying yeah. and up and down for the last two. Are we ready? Everybody, get the hands up in the air. Wave them. Wave, wave the hands. Wave the hands. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey. 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 A dome. A, a tree. tree. A tower. A, a, a great Gas Yes. Hi. Um, so I'm Svetlana. I'm from um, Dental and School, location in uh, Trinity College, Dublin. And so we had a, a, a quite a good team there. So our issue was uh, due to COVID, um, obviously, as, as you know, all the deliveries shifted uh, to online. And due to COVID, the clinical placements were, um, unfortunately, were very limited. So we had this idea, I work in special care, we had this idea with our team that we need really to get to the students and show them the challenges of being empathetic in the special care. So the empathy, as you know, is an essential part of the patient center and um, healthcare approach. It positively benefits to clinician, to the patient, but um, there's very little agreement in the literature how to best design and deliver training for healthcare trainees as uh, for the empathy. So we had this uh, huge task and we actually um, joined with um, uh, George, St. George University of London. They had the MOOC course already there for the clinical empathy. Uh, but we had to design specific content material that actually would suit our dental students. So we had the dental hygienist students, we had the dental nursing students, and we had the dental science students. So our course was, so we had the, we want to measure if, if the virtual learning model is effective as intervention. And we want to see if the empathy will actually increase after the model. So our model was e-learn, e-learning model we had two elements asynchronous elements it was delivered through the MOOC and we had synchronous elements uh, that included two hours had introduction main body discussion groups and we had a specific to dental cases video recorded play role scenarios so we wanted to transfer those general concept of empathy into the specific uh, dental scenarios special care so we found very interested, uh, first of all, the empathy actually has changed and improved. So we, we measured that with the Jefferson scales of empathy. It's quite robust um, questionnaire. So then the second part was quite interesting. We want to see how students uh, perceived and enjoyed um, the e-learning module. So was um, more or less expected they all liked uh, video scenarios, either dental or medical scenarios, they quite enjoyed that. But actually what was interesting to find out on their uh, feedback that they found the discussions in the small groups and communication and contribution to discussion groups were actually find uh, very useful. And then unsurprisingly, they didn't find a uh, reading resources uh, very valuable and helpful for them. So, um, what I want to say then, so our virtual learning did demonstrate that actually it worked and we increased the empathy, 
we only matched the students that agree to take into the study. So we had this pair matched uh, participants and, and we found that it actually worked. And then, but the, the, this, the downside is that we don't know if the empathy can sustain uh, for long term. So this is something that we would like to do, maybe to take a bigger scale and see if actually how can we sustain that empathy with our e-learn module? Because we find out that the short terms it works, but we don't know if um, the long term um, works. So I think that's the main findings from our study. So um, I don't know. <laughs> sorry, it was my first time um, talking. Um, sorry. Not at all, Svetlana. Well done. Well done. Um, well under time. Um, yeah, so 40 seconds under time. Well done. Not easy. And said when you know when the clock is running. Uh, so uh, well done and a very, very interesting piece of, of, of work. Okay, so from Trinity, we're going to shoot down to what some people would regard as the real capital. I know uh, some of my Cork friends and colleagues there, Ken McCarthy is probably still sort of making the sound for Cork. We have Dr. Jerry Rean, student partner design of immersive virtual reality simulations. Hopefully he might be able to write something that where, where Cork actually win in all Ireland might be a very good... Uh, <laughs> Might be a very very good, but that probably would take too much uh, software programming power to to actually work out an algorithm where Cork could actually win in all Ireland. But there you have it anyway. There, just throwing it down. Jerry, not at all. Okay, yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't be heartbroken. I'm, I'm across. I'm in Cork, but from the other side of the county bones, the Kerry side. So oh, I tend to, I tend to deal pretty well with Cork losses in early football. Would, yeah. <laughs> well, of course, a name like Green. Yes, you're definitely That's it. You're definitely a good Kerry there. Okay, so. Well, from the, from the the kingdom down here, we'll do, we'll do another count here like that. Um, I think as I said now, yeah, people are back in the, in the humor of it there. Now we're going to finish up with it up and down with our second last one. Now we started off going to the left. We're going to go to the right there. Like that. And I want everybody's hands up. Jerry, I'll leave you out of this count because you have to get ready here. Now I know the Kerry man here, your shot will be absolutely bang on there. <laughs> it's like when they us down in 2002. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> are we all ready? Get the hands up, everybody. Okay, we're going to go to the right here. Catherine Crown and I'm watching you here. I can see you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, going to the right. A hain. A doe. A tree. A car. A coy. 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 A here at University College Cork. Over a number of years, I've asked students, uh, this is a painting from the Glucksman Art Gallery at UCC, a blinkered view of it through a very narrow lens. So what are you looking at? And these are science students. Invariably, they will say something biblical or certainly something from an older time based on the dress. What they do tend to agree on is it's nighttime. Show a bit more of that image and all of a sudden, well, okay, it's not biblical anymore. That was actually a cactus. And it looks hey. more... It looks more South American and Central America, but I still agree that this is nighttime is what we're talking about. Reveal a little bit more and all of a sudden that was a river. It's not nighttime. And the point being is that when it comes to challenging concepts like molecular biology, most of the, a lot of the students are actually blinkered in this. The lens that they see molecular biology through does not show them the full picture because it's abstract. It is invisible to them. And this was our entry point to the study, which was funded by the National Forum. And the Elevate team set about developing methods grounded in subtle and pedagogy, but how to deliver a real learning experience for students in this space to enable them to explore. So interactive learning, learning by doing. 3D model simulations, working in either groups or individuals, and using virtual reality as a form of self-directed learning. We wanted them to experience their learning. So the idea of developing micromodules around digitalization, giving them multimodal entry points, and here at University College Cork, using the connected platform for a grounded education. Put that together, and we should have an enlightening experience for students, giving them the opportunity to achieve deep learning, giving them an applied understanding built around a performance of understanding, a capstone experience, which through all of that, we believe will unlock the course potential. Now, the important thing here is that students were placed at the center of. They weren't participants, they were partners. And with them, we designed several virtual reality simulations. 
I'll just show you a snapshot of one here where you can enter in a fully immersive space and you're in with a plasma, the piece of molecular DNA that a lot of students find quite difficult conceptually to work around. This does a number of things. They can spatially work with the plasma, but they also have to construct the plasma. So there's an element of prior knowledge. Each of the components then has a theory built with it and an assessment that's built into the simulation. It's just one of several simulations that we developed. And the students can progress through this either in a desktop or fully immersed. And if you're wondering what's the relevance of plasmids in today's world, think AstraZeneca uh, or Sputnik vaccines. Without plasmids, we would not have them. Now, as I said, our focus was not the technology per se, it was developing a roadmap. How do you build and use these technologies and moving to AI eventually, but how do we build a roadmap first so that we take the right path? So we see as an introductory experience as being key, you need to be aware of the prior learning of the students and you need to link your virtual experiences to that learning. Then the virtual reality experience itself lends towards the final performance of understanding. So you're building knowledge and skills development. And we see it very much as an iterative process where the performance feeds back to the introductory experience, continuously upgrading, continuously enhancing, always having the students as partners. As part of that roadmap, we think it's important that you have an entry point to accessing knowledge. That has to be universal. And you need multiple entry points to, to reach the class that you teach. We want to move beyond the test and score principle and foster deep learning and apply knowledge in other disciplines or modules, so cross-disciplinary. It's also important that mental models are challenged and rebuilt, and we can do this using experiential learning. And again, really important that it's UDL oriented. There are spatial uh, aspects here that will, cannot be delivered in a 2D platform and it is student paced. It offers them student paced learning. And we see it again as iterative. And it doesn't replace the teacher. It's teacher led, teacher guided. It is active, finishing with a capstone experience. So how do we get there? We need the building blocks. So subtle expertise, disciplinary expertise, technical expertise. Put that together, you can frame your abstract concepts. You need the scientific technique, you need the virtual reality technology to go with it. What does a plasma sound like? What would it feel like to touch? We have no idea. All of that together can offer a digitalized experience for our students offering them access to these challenging abstract concepts. And what we believe is giving them the full picture. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. That was brilliant. Well done. Really, really good. You took a lot of complex stuff. As I said, anybody can take complex stuff and make it sound complex. You took very complex stuff and made it very accessible. And I loved your, your finish there. So, uh, yeah, Mahan Bugul. Okay. Uh, as I said, I, I am mindful of uh, you know everybody getting their, 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 their grub in on time. So we're going to shoot back up to GMIT, this time to Dr. Karma Quigley, developing data analytics processes to inform and enhancing uh, learning. So uh, if, if Karma is there already, it's okay. We're going to finish off with our last one here, Jerry. I'll let you off the last count, which are doing this one. I want to see you all up able to see it like that. Now, um, <clears throat> so um, anyway, we're going to be going up on the one this time. Right, so we're going up able to see. Alice, I can see you're dying to get up and jump around there like that. <laughs> oh, Absolutely. yeah. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. <laughs> I think of all of those boring conferences you've gone to. Well, like, no one can ever say that that they the, got the marathon. I tell you, you'd be fit at the end of this. If you've joined in for all of these, you'd be fit. Are we all ready here? Get the hands up, and then we're going to go up on the one, down on the two, up on the three, down on the car, up on the cooing, and then a big loud gossip. A big shout out this time. Aaron Coslow, I want to see you up out of your chair as well. I don't want to see anybody sitting down there. Okay, here we go. Uh, hey. 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 <laughs> A dog, Hello. Eamon, I'm watching you. A tree. A tree. Eamon. A car. A car. A cooey. A cooey. A cooey. A All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for that. So uh, this is a, a very quick talk about developing some data analytics processes. And I suppose to start, you could give an hour to what analytics means for a whole lecture course. But for us, we're trying to look at analytics from a, an institution level and from a course level rather than you know we spend a lot of time looking analyzing different objects within the course or maybe just modules and the team that we are we're trying to map those data flows so that we can actually present it to all levels of the college so not just lecturers but also 
uh, middle management and then potentially upper management. And so to do that, it's not just myself and Atain and Garrett. There's actually a whole team of us working away. So you can see it's been a while. Uh, there's a few giveaways that it's been a while. This is a pre-COVID picture and we've had a few more team members join us, but it's a really diverse team. There are academics, there are technical staff, and then we also have a research student who's joined us this year. Um, and within that, our project has really focused on building up in-house skills and in-house knowledge, because what we are trying to do is establish a system that is not just based around one platform like Moodle, not just based around, you know, can we get something that sits inside Moodle? Because you can buy a, buy something if you're looking for something like that. Um, but is around being able to individually query different systems, bring that together through some kind of presentation there, layer, and then present that layer in a way that is secure and safe so that we can present it to the people who need to see it and only the people who need to see it. We want to be get away from this, you know what, so much sharing still happens through Excel sheets. And we want to get away from that. We want to get into dynamic sharing so that people can be given access, access can be taken away, and selected data can be shared. And so as soon as you start to think about, well, can I query data from Moodle? Initially, we were using SQL queries, which anybody who knows too much will say, well, if you're SQL querying a live database, you're likely to cause harm if that gets any bigger than just a small query. So what we've done is by, um, you know, this is based on a SATL funded program where we spend a lot of our funding on developing in-house skills. We work at Microsoft and Spanish Point, and we spend a lot of our time at boot camps. And now we have an ability to query Moodle, take that information, store it in Azure, and present it out through Power BI. And then that can sit within Teams. And once you're in Teams, well, then you can actually join any other information you like into that. And when you do that, then all of a sudden you get a picture like this and everybody looks at that picture and say, God, that picture doesn't make a great lot of sense to me. Well, let me simplify it for you. In these circles, you have different cohorts or different groups of people, be they academic staff or access office staff or maybe science office staff or academic office um, administrators. And each of them have their own data inputs and they also have the things that they need back out again. So the easiest way to have a look at this is actually to just go and see what a dashboard might look like. And I will say that we are not so lucky in GMIT that all of our students have a litter of names. So none of these students are real. This is all um, creative data, but I'll just give you a quick one minute tour around what this might look like. So you can see we have a list of students and we have scores generated based on their access of how their, how their class scores are going, but also based on how long it's been since they've accessed whatever particular service we're interested in. We can join that then with attendance scores and we can use that to evaluate which students we think may or may not be at risk. And of course, this is a, a general dashboard for a large student cohort of two or 300 students. You can narrow that down to individual course cohorts or you can narrow that down to different students who might be at risk. And having the ability to present diverse sources of data in a single place, but also streamed by who you need to see is then really powerful in terms of informing lecturers on the program board so we can keep a holistic view of students, but also heads of department. It's not really too much good though, unless you have a back and forth data flow. So one of the things that we have set up then, or one of the best ways we find of getting information is to have a SharePoint list. And again, totally spurious data, but you can see that we have a list of students and any lecturer can go in, uh, sorry, any lecturer, any appropriate staff member, and they can input the information they need. So if the student is registered with the access office, the access people can put that in, and then that can be shared out to the dashboard. And then if we go back to the dashboard, we can see that that information is all gonna be collated in one place. So you can break this down in a little bit more detail and you can, if you're interested from a, a class assessment or from an institutional point of view, look at different reported difficulties or people who have withdrawn or deferred and why they might have done that. And then from a, a lecturer and functional point of view, you can replace your Excel sheet with lists of students who are certified as absent or who are registered with an access office and have specific learning needs. And so that can be tailored in such a way that, you know, the only things that come out are the things that are appropriate to the person who is supposed to see it because, second. because it is all controlled through single sign-on. So it is as secure as GDPR uh, will have you need. And so with that, I would just say, thanks for listening. Obviously, we can spend hours talking about it, but long enough, I've been so gassed at. Thomas, that was super impressive. That was really, really good. And as I said, I think, you know, uh, with, with any of the, the gusses, if it's sort of stimulating, kind of goes, you know what, I, I must chat with that person. I must find out more. That, that was it. And I suppose that's the great thing about doing it live. You know, it's just about there to, uh, it was brilliant to see how, how well you all sort of uh, handled it all. And just, can everybody just give a sort of a, a, a 
a virtual sort of uh, round of applause to, to all our presenters, please. As I said, they came in as, as presenters, they've left now as gossiteers and, uh, and, and marathon runners as well now. So it's a, a great, a great uh, feat altogether. So listen, come here. I, I won't delay because uh, it's, it's, it's 1325. We've, we've caught up most of the time. People have done absolutely brilliant. I'm now going to hand back to Leo and uh, I'll see you for tomorrow's gossip. Thank you, Tom. And a uh, round of applause to you as well for uh, that's two days in a row now you've kept this thing really spot on. So um, great achievement. Um, I'm just going to hand over now to um, our student uh, members of our student uh, associate assembly for some reflections on, on what we've encountered in the last hour. Uh, we have Megan Griffiths from Hibernia, who I'm going to hand over to now, and in the in chat, and I see she's been active already, Claude Cahill from NCI. So, Megan, over to you now for your reflections. Thank you. And first and foremost, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I'm about to drive home now, and I my head being pulled a million different ways, and it's fantastic. It be, it's so fa uh, fascinating to just know how much research is going on in all of the different areas. So, thank you. I think for me, there's just kind of some of the key points, I guess, from the different bits and pieces. Um, apologies, uh, Brett, sorry, it's the Open PD course. I'm so excited. I'm so ready to do it. I can't wait for Spring 22. But one of the big things that really stood out was actually the sensors on horses. So it's using the sensors on horses to allow for a better understanding between rider and horse and how you said there's parallels to physiotherapy. And I wonder, is there parallels and is there possibilities of using it in patients who are nonverbal and actually improving their care? Um, and it's understanding more about them. So it's, it is really, it's, it's, it's within um, education, yes, but it'd be fantastic to see it through healthcare. Um, as well as the terminology used, it, it, it brought me to Carl Linnaeus, uh, the father of taxonomy. I am a zoologist by nature. Um, and it, it's just, it's, it, it reminded me of the importance. It's how are we supposed to collaborate and share ideas if we're all using different language? So I think your real points on terminology and the fact that we need to kind of be aware of the different terms used for all of the different resources, it's, it, it's, it's pretty huge, but thank you. Um, sorry, now I took down notes. There's just so much going on. Um, Angelica, it was, we're in such a tremendous time, uh, specifically in regard to education and accessibility and access to research, resources is very much part of that. I know at the moment there's massive protests going on over housing and affordability, but resources is an area that's often forgotten. So OER would not only support a richer educational experience for many students, but improve our understanding across all disciplines. Uh, the notion of gatekeeping research conflicts with the core aspects of research, which is to share and learn from one another. It doesn't make sense to me. Um, so Angelica, it's fantastic to know about the work being done to explore OER and boost its use. So thank you, and I hope it continues to grow. Um, apologies. Oh, Trevor. <laughs> Troublesome knowledge is a fantastic term. Um, and threshold concepts perfectly describe the breakthrough moment I strive for as a teacher. It's that moment where students, they grasp that concept that's been, it's at them for ages. They haven't been able to get their head around and it's that breakthrough where they're like, ah, it's clear as day. It makes perfect sense. So having terminology and also having a framework and, and key terms that could be given to teachers to help them understand these students and understand what they need to aid their understanding. It extends beyond simplifying ex um, explanations and activities, providing an alternative approach. Um, I'm looking forward to actually reading more with it with my cup of tea later on. Uh, Svelana, your presentation was fascinating. Um, I'm well versed in virtual education, but I'd never have imagined virtual ed being able to actually to teach them a skill such as empathy, which for me would be very much an in-person uh, learning experience. So this was fascinating. It really highlighted the benefit of small group ed teaching, peer learning, some things are things that are often missed from higher ed classrooms and lecture halls. Um, I do hope the empathy can be sustained and I wish you the best of luck in the future development of this program. Um, I really, really hope it gets implemented across the board because that would be huge. Uh, Jerry, is there any way I can get a crash course on the molecular biology via VR? Uh, it's the most avoided area in biology for me, but I now want to return to my undergrad to do it. Should I be able to do it through VR? Um, I applaud, I applaud sorry, the inclusion of students in opinions and experiences in its development. It, it can be forgotten in designing new tech and practices. It's just, we, we run away with ourselves like, this is fantastic. We love this, but we neglect the fact that the people we're teaching have had no input. So I applaud that. I think it's the way forward when it comes to improving teaching and learning. I really hope to see this roadmap implemented and the use of VR in across the board, but specifically sciences, because to me, that would make it more accessible. It would improve understanding and it would create those 21st century learners that we're hearing an awful lot about. 
and Cormac. I would be lying if I said I truly understand that, st- understood that analytics. It's just, yes, but your presentation really gave me an insight as to how it could improve teaching and learning. One thing is the core role collaboration plays in ensuring and monitoring student progression. So it's quite reassuring to know that this could possibly mean that students, less and less students fall through the cracks. It's very easy for a student to slip through the cracks when staff aren't communicating. It's, oh, they might just be doing bad in my subject. Oh, they might just not be showing up to my lectures or they might not be interacting with my content. But by having all of their analytics in one place, it means that any staff, like any uh, appropriate staff within the institution can see this. It means that we can monitor student progression and we can make sure that they don't fall through the cracks completely. Apologies. I feel like I could have myself talked about all of your talks for so long, but thank you. Um, uh, Yes, just thank you so very much. Megan, thank you. Um, What a wonderful uh, summary. Um, and you packed so much into your reflection there. And I think also it's noted that um, you give proper meaning to the phrase that students should be in the driving seat for teaching and learning. So well done for that too. Um, Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) So look, um, we're uh, just coming to an end. Um, The great news is lunch will be served. Um, It's in a location of your choice with a menu of your choice made by you, wherever you want. Um, And it only remains for me to thank everyone for such a great uh, um, uh, inputs and insights um, in today's um, series of presentations from Brett through to all of the uh, GASTA presentations. Um, Just a heads up, tomorrow, where uh, uh, the journey goes on, next steps, the launch of next steps, a variation as well on the theme and that, that tomorrow we're going to be looking at poster presentations. Um, please keep uh, uh, going to the National Forum website for the latest updates and information. And also for those of you who haven't experienced it on the other side of all of these events, we have a, a team from the forum putting all of these components together and managing the chats, etc., and things like that. And um, I'm so grateful to them for putting this event and all of the events throughout this month together. Uh, Thank you all, enjoy your lunch and see you soon. Bye-bye.